Today's guest is Dr. Anna Kabeka, a repeat guest for us. Dr. Kabeka is one of our go-to resources for women's hormone health, and we had a lot of fun talking with her in this conversation. Check out Dr. Anna's new book, Menu Pause, just released, a totally genius volume that is part cookbook and part rotating nutritional protocol so that you can support your ever-changing female hormones with a revolving roster of foods. You can learn all about it at drannakabeka.com. And if you order now, you'll receive seven awesome bonus gifts. Check it out. We hope you have as much fun learning from Dr. Kabeka as we always do. Let's get this show started. Please welcome Dr. Anna Kabeka. Hi, I'm Erin Power. And I'm Laura Rupsis. We're certified health coaches, and this is Health Coach Radio. This podcast is about the art, science, and business of health coaching. We share our insider tips to help you become a better coach and entrepreneur. And we interview expert guests to discover how they've made it in this growing field. It's time for health coaches to make an impact. It's time for Health Coach Radio. Dr. Anna, welcome back to the show. We are super excited to talk to you again and hear what's new. How are you? I am so happy to be here with you. I'm doing great. Thank you. (laughs) Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for gracing us again with all your expertise. So um, Erin and I, certainly, we were reminiscing before we clicked record about our last conversation, but so let's refresh our listeners' memory about who you are. Can you give us a little background story? Oh, yeah. So I'm a board certified OBGYN and I trained at Emory University in Atlanta. And I went to an osteopathic medical school for um, studying medicine way back 1990, 91 is when I started medical school. So I've been in medicine for over 30 years now. And it just blows my mind. And uh, one of the things that I've learned as an OBGYN is to study our hormones and in my own experience, like my doctor's bag was empty and that's where I kind of fell into an early menopause and infertility diagnoses and all of that at age 39. And that really changed the my life. And it took me on a journey around the world. And as a result of what I learned from Eastern medicines and traditions and, and also some of the world's leading scientists, I, I incorporated that into my life and uh, reversed early menopause and became pregnant at 41 naturally with my miracle child, the child I was told I would never be able to have, Ava Marie. And so now I'm 55 with a 14 year old <laughs> <laughs> doing, doing teenage years and post menopause. So um, I was really able to understand like the diagnoses we give. Um, are come with a very heavy weight and are probably, you know, uh, overstated and should not be given as a finite type of determination for someone, a label, let's Mm -hmm. say, and removing those labels have, has now been the greatest joy of my life for me and my patients and, um, my mission. So, wow. Removing the labels. What do you mean by that? So you can say someone has diabetes or you have early menopause or you're diagnosed with infertility. Mm -hmm. So those are like death sentences. I mean, that can sound like a death sentence. You have cancer where really, let's get to the underlying reason why you're manifesting in this way. And so then we look at, okay, well, what's causing for me, what's causing this early menopause? What's causing this infertility? And for me, it was trauma, stress, acute stress, grief, and then, you know, cycle after cycle of pushing my ovaries to their limit with the highest doses of injectable meds. So all of that had a toll, right? Certainly. And diabetes, is it the warrior genes that we're designed to have and the lifestyle that's working against them? And if we address those issues, so type two diabetes, not so much type one, but if we can address those underlying issues causing diabetes, and, um, and, and re reverse that I've seen diabetes reversed in, in, mm-hmm. you know, and improved tremendously in, in patients in their seventies. And so we have tremendous power over the manifestation of the underlying conditions mm-hmm. that are driving these um, consequences. So those labels and, you know, yeah. a PCOS, for instance, what does that tell a woman about herself? If she has this 
labeled PCOS. I mean, that's terrible label. And what it says, you've got warrior genes. You're designed to be an athlete, to be a leader, to be a champion, you know, Mm -hmm. to take charge, to create legacies. That's what those genes mean. Not fat acne genes, (laughs) you know, fat acne and fertile genes. I mean, seriously, I mean, that's what, you know, I've worked with young girls that have given labels like this and that's what they think about themselves. They're like, oh no, girl, you've got Mulan, Pocahontas, you know, Amazonian warrior, Wonder Woman genes. I mean, that's what you've got. Lucky you, lucky me. I can live in the Amazon, I can live in the desert for six months with no food and water and I'll be fine. I've got those genes. (laughs) I'm interested in these warrior genes, but what I'm hearing you say, just to kind of close the loop on this, um, this labels thing is it's so patients going to the doctor are given the disease state diagnosis. Maybe instead they should be given. So you were saying root cause or like symptoms of, you know, something like that, a little bit more, maybe more actionable, like here's what showed up on a blood test or a Dutch test or whatever, here's where you're at rather than just leaping to delivering the the name of the disease state, because that is disempowering to people in a way like, yeah. Oh, I've got this now, or this is who I am mm-hmm. now. This is now my identity. Is that kind of what you, you're getting at? Exactly. Exactly. Good point. Yeah, and that's empowering, right? That's empowering. Okay. Well, I have these things and these things are modifiable if I do this versus, well, here's your diagnosis. Here's your prescription. And yeah, there's not never a discussion of the underlying issues that is causing that are causing that diagnosis. And we're way advanced. We have, you know, ability to look at your genetics, ability to look at endo, you know, endocrine disruptors, look at your hormones, we have we've come a long way, there's not an excuse. Now, traditional medicines, you know, have adhe- you know, have looked at these underlying physiologic, if we look at Ayurveda, when I traveled, I learned more Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine and, and different types. And we look at, well, what's your constitution? How do we, how do we balance your constitution versus, oh, well, you know, it's just yeah. label you. And it's so common. I hear clients literally, I don't, well, well, I'm a di- I am diabetic, right. Um, versus I happen to have diabetes, right. Or I'm obese instead of, I happen to have a little extra weight, right? So it, it's, it's it literally a name. It changes how you view yourself mm-hmm. um, in terms, you know, in terms of just, and, and, and the way I see it affect people's behavior, that's the biggest difference, right? Instead of this is what's causing the, so, so here I have this diagnosis. This is what we believe is causing the problem. So this is what we do about it. It's I'm diabetic. This is what oh. diabetics do. And, and it's so true. And it goes into this, this labels, right? Like, how do we feel about ourselves when we're given this, or we're giving up a resign, you know, we're resigning to this destiny that we have, like, for example, I had a patient come into my office and she goes, Dr. Anna, you know, I'm 42 years old now. And my, you know, hysterectomy runs in my family. I think I'm due for one. I'm like, who <laughs> does not run in your family? It is not a genetic predisposition, but oh. the underlying physiologic effects that could result in hysterectomy, but it's a mentality. Yeah. And the same is true with menopause in a very negative way. And again, all these terms, like these ICD-10 or whatever, ICD-11, whatever we're on now, coding terms. I mean, there's just a bunch of coding terms to help your insurance companies label you, guide you and adjust your premiums with. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, then we have menopause. So what does that tell a woman about herself? Like, okay, well, you're in menopause and your doctor's like, well, that's just normal. You're getting older. I mean, menopause is natural and mandatory. Every one of us will go through it as a woman, but suffering is optional. And the, what we're talking about, Laura and Aaron, you know, it's that taking away the disempowering diagnosis and empowering the individual to transform and shine and take this opportunity to be even better. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Love it. Cause I feel, I feel like, um, given that I'm a woman in her mid to late forties. And so my clients therefore are in that age range too. It, it, something about menopause is the ultimate, well, I guess this is it for me Mm -hmm. paradigm. Do you know what I mean? Like no one fights back against menopause. It's like, well, we have to disrupt it. menopause time to yeah. disrupt it. Right. Yeah. 
Like we need a disruption in perimenopause. Like women are left to suffer. Well, you're too young for menopause. Look, this perimenopause, that's the symptoms. Mm -hmm. It's a physiology. You don't have to, like within two weeks, we can erase those symptoms. We can balance your hormones. We have to, again, addressing the underlying issues. And and that was it for me, you know, knowing everything I know, and I'm, I'm a hormone expert. So when I went through my second menopause at 48, that downward spiral, the brain fog, the um, anxiety, the mood swings, it was crazy. And I was a single mom taking care of a teenager, a middle schooler, and a wee one in elementary school at that time. And my ex-husband had a traumatic brain injury and was in a coma. I mean, I just can remember all of that stuff. And, um, you know, and it's that downward spiral to the depths of despair and the weight gain without doing anything different was the straw that broke this camel's back. Right. And it was like, okay. And that took me on this journey into the keto green way. And thank God, because it's been an empowering journey. You know, now I'm 55 and definitely postmenopausal now by a couple months for sure. The terminology is terrible. And so, <laughs> and, and, um, and empowered, like, oh, can I even have better sex? Can I even, you know, write another, can a New York Times bestseller? Can I, you know, what can I do now? Like, what's the option? Like, what, and then redefining what does now, as G, I can't even say the word grandma, Gigi, Tita, <laughs> Avo, you know, I'm kind of finding these other names for myself for my you know new grandbaby that's in this world like what does redefining yeah. what this third generation person looks like because I didn't know my grandparents my mom was only alive for a year of her first granddaughter so to me grandparents are aged old and dead right. so having to redefine that so what how do you redefine what menopause looks like to you Mm-hmm. How do you redefine this transition, this transformation? We have to re- we have to get a new image in our in our own mind that's inspiring, enlightening. Sophia Lorenish, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's it's so interesting in just the last couple hundred years how um, communities view the elderly. I'm saying that in air quotes, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, if you take a look at traditional cultures, they revere their elders as being knowledgeable and full of wisdom. And these women aren't put out to pasture just because they're not bearing children anymore. They come to, and they're they're now kind of revered for the advice and the value and the support that they can provide younger generations. And I kind of feel as though that's really been disrupted in kind of the way our communities are built today. Um, we were interviewing it and I don't remember who it was, but it was a guest who was talking about how she really felt women in her age, women, I, I just, I'm 50. I'm going to turn 51 in a couple of weeks. And I'm not, I'm still, I guess technically I could still have a kid if I wanted to. I'm still bleeding, right? Um, things are wacky, but it's still there. And I don't feel old by any stretch of the imagination. Mm-hmm. But I, I talk to women who will use, they'll say things like, well, you know, when we talk about their overall health picture, as a health coach, well, I have high cholesterol and hypertension, but that's normal for people my age. That's the kind of stuff I hear. I'm like, just because something's common right. doesn't mean it's normal. Right. Or it because it's look- mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it's normal, it's not optimal. I mean, it's sad because our society is going over half the women over 50 now will be on three prescription medications. And they're likely antidepressants anti-inflammatories and antacids. Well, that's a setup for cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. So we have to recognize that none of the underlying conditions are addressed in that situation. And Laura, you're soaring, you're, you're gracing through this time period because you've got the, you've got the concept, the lifestyle, right? The lifestyle, the knowledge, the mindset, and that's, that's the gifting. Sometimes those are the, the nutrition and diet are two hardest things to change mm-hmm. in someone's life. But what I'm finding is even harder is that mindset, mm-hmm. that acceptance. And um, not, I don't want to say victim mindset because like, you know, it, it's really um, almost a disempowered, like yeah. I've given up on myself. Mm-hmm. Like right. I can't do this another diet again. And now I'm over the point where they're just not going to work anymore. Or, you know, this is what it's supposed to look. I'm going to get my hair cut short and <laughs> do, do whatever. Right. You know, and I'm like, I'm not doing that. No. Well, so. Yeah, I actually, I actually think that victim is 
an appropriate word, but if we can mm. define it's it's, but it's programming. We've been programmed to believe that we're a victim to menopause. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. that's mm-hmm. it kind of. So there's a big deprogramming involved. And that's what I was saying earlier. It's like, it seems to be the one health condition that we've decided we have no control over. Right. Like culturally. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think this is where, again, the media plays a really big role and the marketing, like what, again, put an image of grandma in your mind. And I actually saw a meme about this, a uh, uh, gray hair, big nose, big belly rocking in a chair this morning. I'm like, that's not funny. That is not money. That is not my reality. Where's the first class private jet? That's right. <laughs> and the yeah. and the sexy companion. I'm just curious. That's my grandma life. That's a, that's it. So so like we have to redefine our, our mental space around this, you know. And that's the longevity. I mean, what do I want in as an adult, as um a a 90 year old? I want to be celebrating, you know many years of marriage with the love of my life and the family we love around us, healthy relationships and energy to be dancing all night. Oh, oh that sounds you know, I, I would love to see more practitioners like you, and this is where health coaches can step in, in this realm. This is absolutely right in our wheelhouse to work on the concept of self-empowerment and standing up for who it is you want to be that yes. Okay. So my opportunity now to contribute offspring to the community is I've had my time. I'm passing the mantle to somebody younger, but I've raised in my case, four kids in your case, four kids plus a stepchild. There's so much that, you know, that you bring to the table and we need to stand firm in our roles here as important aspects of society. And the only way that we can really do that to really impart this wisdom is to be strong and healthy and vocal now. And I wish there were more practitioners that were out there telling patients, it doesn't have to be the way you think it does. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that that shift in empowerment, I was just thinking too, when it comes to labels, like we we're you know, stepmom, I'm a stepmom in French, they use the word belle mère, beautiful mm-hmm. mother. Belle mare. And for stepdaughter, it's belle fille, beautiful girl. No. So there, the terminology we use really can affect us. And so mm-hmm. shifting that terminology, relabeling how we see ourselves, the talk that we're doing, we're, we're even subconsciously, the images that we're associating with this, we have to disrupt them. We have to change them because all of the symptoms, the hot flashes, the mood swings, the weight gain, the hair loss, the brain fog, the memory loss, the urinary leaking, the lack of uh, orgasm or pleasure or vaginal dryness, all of those symptoms are reversible. Mm -hmm. All of those symptoms are reversible 100%, 100% with rare exception. Wow. Okay. I, I want to dive into one symptom specifically and get your take on it. If, if you don't mind. And it's because it's the one that my clients, um, seem to present with the most, and I'm not presenting with it as a perimenopausal woman. And so I'm just bewildered. And so I, I I don't know if it's because I've been really emphasizing my, you know, my, my anti-inflammatory nutrition for a long time or whatever it is, hormone balancing this and that, but here's a, here it is. Let's just set it up. Here it is. It's this abdominal, this lower abdominal area. Mm -hmm. And here's the deal. But some people will say I'm gaining fat in my lower abdomen. I had a client of mine who said, I've got this, all this fat in my lower belly, fat in my lower belly. And I'm on the phone with this person. I don't actually get visibly see my clients in real life. That's just one of my things. I don't know what they look like. I don't actually care what they look like. Um, And I said, do me a favor and reach down and grab hold of this abdominal fat. And she, she went, she reached down and she's, well, I can't really pinch it. It's, it's not, it's not like flabby, but it's, it's protruding and it's big. It's almost like it's swollen. So I've heard this symptom. I don't know what it is, but it's this lower belly that protrudes, but it's not always fat. It's something in the uterus or something. Do you have a sense of what that is? That lower well, belly? Think, yeah, I think, I mean, it can be a few, I mean, it, I think it can be a few things. You want to look at gastrointestinal bloat. Mm-hmm right? Large colon issues, small, 
you know, intestine issues and what's going on because, you know, constipation is one of the biggest reasons for estrogen dominance and toxicity and hormone disruption. So is there something that is there a piece of that in there and food sensitivities like our, there's a rub, right? We can no longer tolerate the chicken salad for lunch. I, I just have this thing against chicken salad for whatever reason, because it's like that diet lunch. I'm like, stop eating chicken salad. Mm. Just like you're going to have a food sensitivity anyway. So, you know, is it, is, is there something going on there with the food sensitivity, with the colon, with the gut, with the bacteria? So that's one thing too. And is there an inflammatory kind of response going on? Is there, you know, inflammatory within the peritoneum? Is there irritation? Is there, you know, is there something else going on there? And I would really look at that's when it's always, you know, a, a detox, I call it the 21 day keto green detox, whatever we got to do to cleanse, you know, cleanse and improve and heal even at 72 hour gut rest, you know, with bone broth or just with water or with keto green shakes, you can do it a few different ways can be really restorative and that will make a difference. But the, you know, lower abdominal, the lost, like the waist loss, like when we're losing our waistline, um, and we want to lose, we want to get that hourglass back. I mean, that's cortisol. That is cortisol. That is cortisol. That is cortisol. And again, with progesterone, our mother hormone and our, like I would say progesterone is the lid to the pressure cooker of our lives. And it starts to decline in this perimenopause state. And it's like taking the lid, sometimes it's like taking the lid off the pressure cooker. And that's where all of these symptoms are coming on. And if you've got stress, that's, that's the, you know, that's the biggest drain on your progesterone. So that's where that, you, know, you get all the mood swings and everything, but that cortisol, that cortisol drain, further depleting progesterone is contributing to that, that uh, loss of your waistline and your belly fat. Okay. I love this answer. And the reason I love this answer is because anatomically <laughs> your lower belly holds up. There's there, it, maybe it's fat. Maybe it's your gut. Maybe it's your uterus. Maybe it's your mm -hmm. waist. Maybe it's actually your waist or your trunk. That's but women are, are, we, women are just programmed to say, I have this lower belly fat that came from menopause. It's like, it could be a hundred things, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. great news, which is great mm -hmm. news. Let's start chipping away at it. Let's, mm -hmm. let's get your gut reset. Let's see if we can work on managing your stress and maybe whatever the inflammatory load. Um, that's this nuance, I think is what is what women going through menopause and perimenopause have no line of sight on. Right. You know what I mean? It's just like, I'm, I'm 50. Therefore I get fat. That's how it works. Right. You know? Right. This client right. that I was speaking about, she said, sometimes she said to me on the phone, sometimes I wake up and she, these are her words and I look skinny. Yeah. Like I woke up and I said to my husband, look, honey, I look skinny today. And it's like, that's what I'm talking about. If it goes away overnight, it's not fat. It's not something fat. else. Right. Yep. And that's something too. examining patients like on an exam table and they're complaining. And I'm like, you know, you can palpate, you can do that yourself. You put two fingers on and just kind of pound over and you can feel, does it feel like a drum? And I would tell my clients, you're not, you're not fat. You've got gastrointestinal. I mean, you've got something going on with your gut. We've got to fix this. And with it, I mean, you can really reverse that, but there's that, that bloat, right? There's the bloat. And what happens when well, you get antacid? right? You get laxatives and that's not never addressing the underlying issue, You're causing more problems, get a diuretic. I mean, I remember I, I did it as a young physician, uh, you know, 50, an old patient, 50 something <laughs> old patient would come into my office and they'd have lower extremity edema. I've got, you know, a little bit of high blood pressure here. Are some, you know, let, let me give you some um, diuretic medication to help both those symptoms. And I'm so smart, right? Mm -hmm. Well, hell no, let's fix your gut and you will diurese. I mean, I can get you to diurese that probably 10 pounds of fluid within three days. So come on now. So it's a whole different approach than what I was, what I was trained. Yeah. 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 Would you mind, so just for the benefit of our audience, helping people understand what is supposed to happen hormonally as oh, you yeah. go through perimenopause to menopause, and then contrast that with where things go so wrong, how um, just our modern lifestyle and environment is causing additional problems that make this natural process feel horrible and very unnatural. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. Cause it's so like, what is supposed to happen? What's mm-hmm. supposed to happen for us and the transition of hormones. I mean, we get this natural, we get a nice warm up period, the transition of hormonal decline as we get older, reproductive hormone decline, as we get older, it's, it's, there's a time frame, so we can adjust on a regular basis. But if you, so the decline of DHEA in our mid to late twenties, progesterone mid to late thirties, and then as a result, estrogen and testosterone decline because progest from progesterone, we make DHEA and cortisol down this way, but to make DHEA cortisol, like is the life-saving hormone so that we're going to sacrifice everything to make that cortisol. And then DHEA will convert to estrogen and testosterone, uh, testosterone and estrogen in that order downstream. And so like when you're, you know, as we get older, we're making less estrogen and and testosterone. And with that, certain physiologic changes naturally occur. Like there's the concept of gluconeogenesis is estrogen hormone dependent. I really think progesterone is the big player here, but it's estrogen dependent. And for our brain to use glucose, we need estrogen on board. So we're declining, our brain starts starving from glucose. And that's why we we shift to ketones because use of ketones Mm -hmm. is not hormone dependent. So we're kind of starving our brain for fuel a little bit here and in a way, and we're getting hot, like the normal experience if we don't change anything are hot flashes, you know, weight gain, hunger, uh, mood swings, brain fog. Those are neuro neurologic symptoms, right? This period of neuroendocrine vulnerability that we enter age 35 to 55, neuroendocrine vulnerability is, is, is this quick, rapid transition with that decline of progesterone and the shift. And even if we're supplementing, if we're not changing the lifestyle factors that are affecting two of our biggest lifestyle hormones, and that is insulin and cortisol, if we're not shifting, if we're not becoming more insulin sensitive, because we will become more insulin resistant as we Mm -hmm. age and cortisol naturally increases as we age. So we've got to actively create insulin sensitivity, we have to actively manage cortisol, and of course, optimize the most powerful hormone in our body, which counteracts the effects of cortisol, and that's oxytocin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, optimize this love and bonding hormone through physiologic acts and mind, and mind processes and love. And those are things that we can do that empower, you know, some of the most negative genes that we have that will uh, work against some of the most negative genetics. I find it so fascinating. And I feel like this relationship between the female reproductive hormones and like the metabolic hormones, like insulin, cortisol, uh, there, there, I had no idea that gluconeogenesis was like an estrogen driven or possibly progesterone driven process, but, but dropping oxytocin, like you did at the end there, that was an aha for me. Cause think about Mm -hmm. it. Like, what is a woman's role through our reproductive part of our life? It's to grow, nurture, love, and care for offspring. And it's like, once we're kind of out of that phase of life, feasibly our oxytocin levels, I don't drop because it's not necessary anymore, but we can, we can do things to bring that back up. Like that's a real, that's a, that's, um, that's a, that's a brain chemical we can actually influence by our, by our lifestyle inputs. Absolutely. It brings us back to almost what, what it is to be a woman, which is to be the nurturer, the loving, caring, you know, of the species. And to feel that, right? It's like, at the end of the day, I ask a question, where did I see love today? Where was I loving? You know, it's to feel where, you know, where did I feel love? So that receipt, that giving and receiving, and for women, it's often hard to receive, we constantly give. So receiving is important. And now the second stage, the second spring, the Japanese call this time, the second spring of our lives. So in the second spring of our lives, how do we generate oxytocin? You know, we like a lot of time, the wisdom, the meditation, the prayer, right? That ecstatic prayer to really connect with God, our higher power, and that's oxytocin to nurture the next generation, to support them, to feed in our wisdom into others that giving, giving philanthropy is an oxytocin increasing Mm -hmm. benefit, right? That's a biblical, you know, give and you will receive. I mean, it is oxytocin um, boomerang effect. No, I love that. So in terms of kind of naturally what is supposed to happen, 
Um, I would imagine that under a normal traditional ancestral approach to this, we would have been spending far more time in nature. We would have been living together with family and um, young ones that we can, you know, I, I don't know about you, but as a kind of a natural caregiver, I get a tremendous amount of pleasure and just joy from helping somebody. And it doesn't have to be kids. It can just be my neighbors, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, and helping out kind of where we can. But I, I, you know, when, from an ancestral point of view, this is kind of how we all survived, right? By leveraging each other's wisdom and being there to support each other. So that in other times might've been a lot more natural and part of our everyday environment where now we're far more isolated, particularly the last two years or so, right? So there's, to Aaron's point, there's a lot that we can do in terms of choices and how we interact with others to increase that sense of oxytocin. But then also from a diet and movement perspective, we weren't sitting around binge watching Netflix, right? Maybe we were taking a walk. Perhaps we were gathering berries or whatever. But from a food perspective, we were eating nutrient-dense, fresh, whole foods, um, likely not full of a bunch of processed carbohydrate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I would love your perspective from it. So you talk about this concept of keto green, um, and you've just came out with a new book called, called menu pause. And I'm sure addresses the whole nutritional point of view of this, but you know, I mean, I see this with women all the time who are like, I can't eat what I used to eat. And the same is true of me. And what's interesting is, um, when I first lost the early baby weight with my first two kids, I did it on a very high fat ketogenic diet. Um, lost it all, but I can't eat all that fat anymore. As I've gotten older, I can't, um, I've got to kick up the protein and I've got to pull down some of that, that fat, you know, um, please tell me you've got lots of greens in there too. I do. I did. I mean, I eat a big ass salad every day for lunch, you know, and I include some sort of vegetable probably at most, at most meals, even breakfast a lot of times. So anyway, I would love your perspective from a nutritional point of view. How can we best emulate, um, and support the body, what's happening naturally? How can we work with what's happening naturally to stay healthy and active and energy and all of that? And and I love it because we do want to work with what's happening naturally. We want to work with mother nature. I would say yeah. you can't beat mother nature. You got to work with her and with honor and respect and all of that. And that comes to the temple, the cathedral of our own spirits, right? Mm-hmm. We have to work with this cathedral of our own spirits and optimize where we can, right? And I, and I love that because that's, you know, back to the oxytocin, you know, what does this next half of our life look like? How we're giving into others and feeding into others. And it comes to how we perceive ourselves. And um, Dr. Martinez in his uh, work on psychoneuroimmunology talks about one of the uh, 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 characteristics of um, centarians, people who have lived to be over a hundred is a healthy narcissism. Like, oh, of course they're, you know, my neighbors love me. I love my neighbors. You know, it's like, of course they do, right? Of course they want to come see me versus no one wants to come see me. Um, I, you know, isolating and over the traditions to, uh, I will answer your question, Laura, but I'm thinking like over traditions and from my work around the world and in my new book, Menopause, I talk about menopause around the world, that from my experience, what I've had the, we're, as in America, we're a young country, we're mm-hmm. a couple hundred years old, right? We're a young country, pretty much. And so like, look at some of the traditional societies, what have they done? They have multi-generational households, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's part of it. You're not left out. You're not put in a nursing home. Right. And that can be, that's fear driven too. It's like, well, who's taking care of me? What do I have set up? What's the rest of my life? Well, I will die with my family, you know, till my last breath. That's the, you know, that's a sense of security and safety too. And we celebrate everything, celebrate birthdays, take a week to celebrate a wedding. Mm -hmm. Like we're not going to forget you because we love you. I don't care if it's your hundredth birthday or, you know, we're 55th, 56th birthday coming up. We we love you, right? We're celebrating you and and allow yourself to be celebrated versus dismissing it. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself that healthy narcissism. And, and that's powerful. Like, that's okay. That's good. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. You know, how do we, from the standpoint of, um, in in addition to these lifestyle inputs, from the standpoint of being able to honor and celebrate and work with what's happening with our bodies hormonally, how do we address that from a nutritional point of view? Um, you know, and maybe from a movement kind of point of view, as far as keeping the body moving and supple and high rates of 
skin, all that. Let me tell you about my friend, Carolyn. She's an athlete with a passion for health. She'd been health coaching friends, families, strangers, not even knowing it was a thing. She just felt called to help other people live their healthiest lives. Then she discovered the Primal Health Coach certification program, and she went from feeling like an imposter to belonging to an amazing community of like-minded health pros. Confident and finally able to enjoy a fulfilling and profitable career doing exactly what she loves. Carolyn is one of thousands of certified Primal Health Coaches living their best lives and helping their clients do the same. The Primal Health Coach Institute offers a variety of health and fitness certifications and specializations. Our graduates are practicing unique coaching specialties and changing lives in countries all over the world. We're always growing and evolving, so come grow with us. Visit PrimalHealthCoach.com to check out our courses and offerings. Well, one thing that I've learned, especially in this keto green lifestyle that I've been doing now since 2015, when I discovered it for myself and brought it to my patients and then brought it online and in my books is working with this keto green lifestyle. So it's with intermittent fasting, it's healthy ketogenic food. I mean, healthy fats, right? Our avocados, our salmon, our olive oil, our, you know, MCT oil and nuts and seeds and things like that, that we can incorporate into our diet, high quality protein that we're paying attention to grass fed, organic, free range, all of those good things. And, um, and more conscious of like what we eat eight, that's critically important too. And the greens, the fiber, the importance of diversity for our gut. So I've been working in this with intermittent fasting, no more snacking. Like if I hear anyone say menopause diet, three meals, three snacks, it's like, oh, gosh. you're an idiot. So yeah. I'm going to have to be very bold right now and tell them that, but I've read like in New York times, I mean, seriously, like that's a menopause diet. You gotta <laughs> be kidding me. <laughs> so, um, so this working with lifestyle and diet and the key foods, my first book was the hormone fix. And then I went to keto green 16. So to make it simple, 16 key foods with fermented foods and really keeping that plan simple. And in menopause two two times a day, eating two times a day is plenty. It's plenty. We work up to that, right? We work up to that, but we want to have at least 13 to 16 hours of an intermittent fast. And some days it's one meal a day, right? It's an OMAD. Some days you're feasting and that metabolic flexibility is really important post-menopause as well. During this time, we can't do the same thing every day and expect to continue to get good results. And so with menu pause and working with clients online, such a great title. Menu pause, my editor came up with that title. And so, you know, this um, concept is I created five pauses in our plan. So keto green extreme plan is the keto green, but an autoimmune moderation. So no nightshades, no nut seeds, no peppers, no, um, uh, you know, eggplant tomatoes, it makes me cry to do that diet, but I do really well on it. But you know, it's and it's six days. So each plant for two 72 hour GI mucosal tract turnovers, 72 hours for the mucosal lining to regenerate. So within, you know, when we do anything three, four day, it's the hardest, yeah. but day five, day six, you've got, you know, you've got good, clean, healthy mucosa without the antagonist that may have been creating that belly bloat putting you in storage mode, make, giving you headaches, right? And aches and pains in your joints. You've cleared that in that shortest time possible. So the then w there's a plant-based plan because sometimes we have to pause the meat and restore gut microbial diversity for our healthy estrobilum, right? Estrogen detoxification and serotonin production happens in the gut. That mm -hmm. happens in the gut. So moodiness. So I incorporated a a um, plant-based plan. And then I have a carnivore plan because sometimes your digestive enzymes, your, mm -hmm. you know, are so af affected that you can't digest the plant foods that you need to digest. Now we're going to heal you from that. Like, I want to heal you from that. I don't want you to have to have, like when I, it makes me cry when I hear, I have patients come to me and they can eat only three foods. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible to live that way. We have to heal. Why? 
your body's only tolerating this and address the, you know, maybe it's addressing parasites, viruses, yeast, bacteria, what's going on, you know, uh, cell membrane breakdown. We can, we can restore that because our regenerating gut mucosal lining every 72 hours, our body is constantly renewing and restoring itself given the proper uh, nourishment we will do that really well. And then I have a cleanse plan because, you know, if you're doing them in order, you'll go right from carnivore and high uh, ketosis into a beautiful cleanse that will be a liver gallbladder flush to help us cleanse the gallbladder so we can digest healthy fats again, even better. So we can function with, you know, just feel better. But of course, the extra side effects that I really like are clear skin, clear eyes, you know, good, strong hair, all that important you know, all that important self narcissistic stuff that we should enjoy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I have a carb up plan, because you and I both know, sometimes we're so restricted for so long, that first, it's not never, never my case, but in some of my patients cases, um, we have to actually I have to add back some healthy carbs into their diet. So we do a carb up plan. And I've had clients lose weight during the carb up plan. It doesn't happen to me. But like, it's just what feeded them. And then they slept better. Mm -hmm. And you know, it just, and it was, it's very interesting to see like, wh what do we need now? Yeah. And um, which, you know, for some clients, like, well, which plan should I do next? So I do have a menu pause quiz and each of the chapters start with this may be for you if, but I really do want to go through it like in community with, with clients to see, to see how go through each of the plans and just explore where do I feel best? And that's good for now, but let's not be afraid to change up. Let's not get stuck in the keto camp, in the paleo camp, in the vegan camp, in the carnivore camp. We can't get stuck. Let's mix it up. Variety. Oh, I love that. Oh yes. Bravo. I am so such a staunch advocate for that because you, you mentioned metabolic flexibility, which yes to that. And also though, this natural oscillation through like uh, almost like sometimes you're hungrier, sometimes you're less hungry. Sometimes you're craving red meat. Sometimes you're craving plants and folks get so tied up in the fact that, but I'm on this plan. So I can't, I, you know, I, I'm fasting. So I can't eat four times today, even though I'm hungry four times or I'm, I'm keto. So I can't eat plant or whatever. And I am such a staunch advocate for folks just tapping into what is felt and, and, uh, but I also think the human body is meant to oscillate through different eating paradigms, different mm -hmm. fuels, different inputs. We're not meant like you just, you just finish it up by saying, don't get stuck. People get stuck in their one camp and they just double down on it. And I don't believe just as just my own personal, like anecdotal, just belief that I don't believe that's meant to be the human sort of biological experience. Yeah. Like at all. Absolutely. Right. There are seasons for a reason, right, Erin? I mean, we have been designed to eat seasonally. There are seasons for a reason. I think that remembering that and we're also each one bio individuals, we are bio individuals, and also the gut microbiome, like a trillion of organisms that have to be nourished have to be challenged, right? Like, Let's give them some lectins today. Okay. Let's do that. And right. let's challenge you and see, and see, see how you do. I'm Middle Eastern. So half Middle Eastern. So like chickpeas, hummus, baba ganoush. I've got my nightshades, got my lectins. I'm like, I'm all good. You're doubling down on your hormesis. I um, am. I am totally. But the one example that I'll use, and I don't have any, I don't have any, you know, knowledge of, of this and you do. So you can, you can throw in your actual knowledge, but every now and then my female clients who are still, you know, uh, menstruating will tell me that they were really hungry one day. It just says one day of the month where I just, I can't stop eating. And it's like, great, do it. Your body's asking for it for some reason on that day of your cycle, it's asking you for more. Why don't we just trust that and go for it? Like but people are so worried they have to micromanage and keep themselves like, Oh, I'm doing OMAD. I'm, you know, I'm fasting for 18 hours. And, you know, again, it's just, we're super disconnected from these natural oscillations and undulations in our hunger, in our body's call for n different nutrients. And um, this feels really beautiful because it's like a coming back to the body. And when yes. I say coming back to the body, that's actually, there's actually not a lot of truth in that because most women have been dieting their whole lives and have never been 
you know, Intuitive. actually intuitively connected to their bodies in any way. Mm -hmm. So it's coming back to the body for the first time. We get to do this as we cruise into menopause is kind of cool. It's kind of like really taking the power back for the, maybe for the first time ever. I think that's so beautiful and so well said because oftentimes, you know, sometimes we don't even know how we feel, yeah. you know, we've co so like had to exist and to perform and to please that we don't even know, like, really, how am I feeling? And is this, is this hunger or is this thirst? Is this, you know, is this, what's this brain fog today from, or, you know, where did this emotional outburst come from? What's, what's going on? Like, what am I really feeling? What, what's the underlying where you know, to ask ourselves, where is this coming from to get curious? And now it's an empowerment stage of our life to get really curious and say, Oh my gosh, what am I feeling? Ah, huh, what, what will make me happier today? Like I'm happy already. What will make me even happier today? Like, what can I do to make someone else happy? I'm curious. And I think this stage of life as we get curious, I mean, this is the entrepreneurial kicking in, right? This is the like, okay, I am, you know, you're taking that lead that we are designed, we survived, right? So we, we have that, that leadership ability to embrace as um, we go through this transformation of yeah. menopause. Yeah, we're quick to judge and not so quick to understand sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Ourselves, especially ourselves, especially like, oh, cause I'm old. Uh, look at these wrinkles. I'm like, Oh, what are, you mean? My laugh lines. <laughs> you like my smile lines. Oh yeah. I got those. <laughs> it's been ingrained. I know. I, I, I seem to like these lines right here or these lines from the <laughs> having four children, I guess. But at the end, oh, of yeah, the, the gray hair from the four children that I have to, you know, color out. So well, they're just, kind of part of the journey, you know, when, when, what I learned and, and, and thank you for asking my question, uh, answering my question so thoroughly. One of the things I learned was the fact that your mucosal lining turns over every 32 hours. And I think what an empowering little bit of information that you can literally sort of reshape and, and sort of rebuild a healthy gut in a relatively yes. short period of time. Yes. Yes. You have no idea. Yes. And and so many pause in your book, is that what those stages are designed to do to sort of kind of create an environment that allows different aspects of the mucosal lining to come forward? And could you it's speak to that a little part bit? of the healing, removing things that could be interfering with appropriate healing. Yes. And adding things back that could support healing, like mm -hmm. the whole plant-based plan that could be very supportive, especially if we've been keto for a long time that can be incredibly supportive. And again, eliminating constipation, one of the most significant, mm -hmm. um, and, and to be, to be clear, because that was one of my questions. It's always a question on my intake forms as a physician, like, are you constipated? My patients would say no. And I would do their exam, Aaron, and their belly would be bloated. And mm -hmm. I'm feeling like, okay, I'm like, well, how often are you having bowel movements? And like, oh, once or twice a week. I'm like, you said you're not constipated because I've been that way all my life. I'm like, you've been constipated all your life. No wonder, right? <laughs> so to be clear, you have to have one to two bowel movements a day. Otherwise you are constipated. So, and, and that's a really big issue. And that's where the diversity and healing the gut lining now, but remember, we can eat the most nutritious, balanced, amazing diet, but and this is where the alkalinity part of my programs come in, the green part, that we can be eating the best diet, but still be breaking our cells down with cortisol, chronic everyday stress, that um, post-traumatic stress, that, and especially when we take the lid off progesterone, it is um, the lid off the pressure cooker, that progesterone's declining, then, you know, we're really eroding that, that lining. Cortisol is the key that unlocks the gate to those leaky membranes, to those membranes. You're breaking through a nice, healthy boundary. And cortisol is that key. Zon we know with gluten sensitivity, we see zonulin in mm -hmm. those um, cell membranes, right? We see zonulin in the walls. So like, what's the key? Key is cortisol. The key is cortisol. So what's the anecdote? Oxytocin oxytocin, the most powerful hormone in our body. And I look at it this way. If we look at the um, 
hierarchy, oxytocin is that, that, that God hormone, that benevolent hormone. It's the crowning master hormone. It's the queen of us, oxytocin. And then if you were look at it at a university setting, that's the dean of the university. And cortisol and insulin are your professors, right? And if they're great, if they're well-behaved, you know, if they've got a great leadership, then that trickles down. The student body is those hundreds of hormones we have, each with its own, like the students in a student body, each one has its own designation, its own path. But, you know, under, under good leadership, we've got law and order. But when insulin and cortisol are going crazy, there's mass chaos among the student body, riots and I don't know, burning flags. I don't know what's happening, but it's terrible, right? So that's the hormones in our body. So the same is true. So if we master, and I always go to, I want to, I want to do the least amount of effort to get the best results. That's just my innate laziness. So I want to master oxytocin, right? I want to master oxytocin that will support insulin and cortisol. And it's, I want to master insulin to become as insulin sensitive as my, as I can. I mean, I'm diabe- I lost both my parents to diabetes. My mom never got to be a grandma more than a year. And so, you know, this, this is empowering information. So I can master, I have, those are lifestyle hormones. I've got control over those. I don't care what my genes, I've got those genes, diabetes genes, heart disease genes, you name it, I've got them all. And so, but I can master that. And then as a result, it takes more than hormones to fix our hormones, right? It takes more than hormones to fix our hormones. Then the hormonal sterile, you know, body. And I do, I do keto green and I balance with bioidentical progesterone, my balance cream. I take my adaptogen. You saw me drinking my mighty maca plus supplement. I created these because there weren't answers for me. And yeah, then we can talk about Jolva later, but that's, that's the key, right? That's the secret ingredient. So but I, you know, want to support women naturally through menopause Mm -hmm. so that we have this, this greater state and that, that we have empowered this master hormone oxytocin. And it can feel like impossible. Like, you know, I've been to those deep deaths of despair and death where I wanted to die every day. I'm telling you, it's essential. Empower your physiology. Physiology affects behavior and behavior affects physiology. So we have to come at it both ways. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, Amen. Oh my gosh. Yes. We say that all the time. We talk about that in our school. It's like we, we health coaches are behavior change agents, right? It's easier to, it's easier to change your behavior when your biochemistry is working appropriately. Exactly. Like, Willpower is physiologic. Yes. yes. I'm obsessed with oxytocin all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> Erin, I was Double. totally shopping molecular necklaces. Yes. The other they day. have one. They have one. Because I wear the melatonin molecule around my neck. Um, but oxytocin Love is my favorite. Um, <laughs> one question I have for you, though, is I, I was going back to this idea of, you know, how important nutrition is to get all the, you know, the these professors of the hormonal school dialed in so that your your menopause experience can be easier. So I feel like I dialed this in for myself in my early thirties, which is why I'm having a really fine time. As I go through perimenopause, I got like nothing going on. Is it, when is it, is it too late? You don't, you know what I mean? Like if women are in perimenopause or in menopause, can they claw this back? Well, they can, cause you did, you did it. Absolutely. After and well, post menopause, you can, I have clients in their seventies and eighties. So well post these, I mean, I, if it works for a woman in the transition of her life, let me tell you, it works for guys. It works for teens. It works for everyone. And the sooner an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, the sooner that we can implement these changes and change these lifestyle patterns and behavior, the better it will be. Now, this the menopause should be that that easy, it should be an easy transition. I mean, it's not going to say that we're going to be even with an easy transition, that we're not going to be completely sim- symptom free. But listen to what the symptoms are telling us. If we're having that night sweat in the middle of the night, if we're getting up to use the bathroom, if we're having vaginal, night, what are the symptoms telling? us and what's the anecdote? What can we do to address those, those symptoms? And it, it's communication with our body. So I love this. And I think that, that where you're so ahead, Erin, is that concept that, okay, you know, I've got this, I've got this, I've got this control. I'm making, these are disciplines and practices that do affect physiology. And, you know, that's, that's, we need more of you, right? We need more of you and Laura out there. And I'm glad that you guys are doing this coaching and you have this, you know, platform because that's the, you're the walk 
walking the talk, the living the example. And through this transition, then when we're through, like what, what, what additional natural support, where do we need that additional help and support and not to be afraid because menopause is natural. I feel like so many times I hear from women, oh yeah, well, my doctor said vaginal dryness is normal, but here's some estrogen. I'm like, estrogen's touching the surface. Mm -hmm. It's not addressing underlying tissues and we have to address that stuff. Like don't live with it because it's natural, right? Yeah. 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 So we've heard, I've seen it in we don't talk about it so much within our community, but I see it a lot in the sort of diet culture and diet gurus that I see that talk about uh, the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting for women and why it's not good for women as they age, Um, which I don't believe to be true, but I've seen others come forward talking about how it slows down the thyroid, what have you. So can you please debunk this? Dr. Ed. Yeah, the, Dr. Ed is very, your face is yeah, the look on your face is like, <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. It's out there. That's floating around out there. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of particularly strength training coaches that just like worship carbohydrates and, um, and I don't mean yeah. necessarily the healthy carbohydrates. Yeah. I mean, like pasta. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, even worse. Like okay. junk, that it's a macros based thing. And we have to have your macros dialed in. And they'll, you know, a lot of women, they'll, they'll here, here's their argument is they have a lot of women that come to them that have been dieting and on the ketogenic diet for so long. And that's the reason they've run into problems and that they're miraculously fixed with the six meals a day and a, you know, all these carbohydrates. Many of them have changed their tune on the quality these days. But yeah. You know, I think they've gotten smart about that, but they're still very in this camp about how intermittent fasting and a ketogenic diet are not good for women in menopause, perimenopause. I I have found the opposite to be true. But again, in my case, it's just don't add fat for fat's sake. Don't just continue to add butter. I I don't want to do that either. That doesn't work. So I would love for you to debunk that if you don't mind. Yeah. And don't continue MCT oil that can have a negative Mm -hmm. line effect on your lining too. So we want to look at, again, let's change things up. Let's try, you know, let's look at what's working for us. And I think this is where menu pause came about. Let's, let's take that carb, you know, that carbohydrate boosting week. Let's see how you do with that. doesn't mean I'm going to keep you on that, or you're going to stay on that, but let's see. Let's see. You be your judge. How are you feeling? How are you? Are, are you radiating health and energy? And if you're not, that's a problem. And I, and I know, Laura, when I, I was 22, or 42, 42, when I trained for my first sprint triathlon, first and only, but I checked that box, you guys, I'm not the <laughs> athlete. I like my wine and my books and my couch. So I, um, when I trained for that triathlon, I, I mean, that was the thing you eat these, these sugar, yeah. pills after and all of that, those gummies and drinking these goops and these things. And like, okay, I wish I knew then what I know now I probably, you know, I, I came in fourth, I could have come in second, oh. first. So, yeah. you know, who knows, right? But I was for my age group. Age group. Okay. So, but it's a competitive age group. Wouldn't you agree? The forties are pretty competitive. So it was, um, it was, it was really an interesting, it's interesting to reflect back on the carbohydrate load before. And, and so I think it's that where you have to play with it. We're not all designed the same and our environment, the environment we're living in, the thoughts we're keeping will, um, affect that. And so this is where we want to, I want to say to everyone, challenge your thoughts, try each and every one of these five plans and they're balanced, they're balanced for hormone support and detoxification and energizing and healing. They are balanced in this way with herbs and spices. Food is medicine, food is information. And so I'm giving that to you. So let's change things up and let's see, check in with yourself. How are you doing? How are you doing now? And I think that's the, that's the really big piece. And the, with the book, we have book bonuses too, um, that people can get and, um, on my book page on my website. And one of the bonuses, just that checklist, I want you to check in with yourself for each of the plans. I want to know how you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so, so that was, so that's an important, that's an important self-assessment tool. You know, and and too, when I, when I see a lot of these trainers, I, 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 
from my point of view as a health coach, I don't necessarily see that the ketogenic diet's a problem or that the intermittent fasting in and of itself is a problem, or even a low fat diet is a problem. The problem is so many women are just under eating period. They've been dieting too long. That's the problem. So and then they're think, metabolically destroyed. Yeah, exactly. And no one diet's really going to work. You've got to get back to eating instead of dieting. And this is what, and that's with intermittent fasting. I mean, it is essential. And I say keto green is not just a good idea, menopause and beyond, it's mandatory. But with our with our athletes and, and with this, what's really important was eye-opening to me. It's like, it's not just about what we eat, when we eat, who we're eating with, <laughs> what we eat, ate, right? All of these things um, factor into how our body is going to receive this information. And so that concept of when we are calorie, like a low calorie diet is more destructive than fasting. Yeah. That's what you need to tell those snackers. And a low calorie diet decreases your meta basal metabolic rate more than fasting will. Mm -hmm. And so when we can fast and, and be able to eat, we can't calorie restrict and be able to eat. We've right. now slowed down our, I mean, it's, it's just, it's just, um, survival. It's, it's a survival pattern that our cells have evolved with. So again, we have to work with mother nature, not against her. Intermittent fasting, game changing. We have to get into ketosis to use ketones for fuel for our brain. I don't care if we're supplementing hormones, that's okay. But even better is empowering your body to do what it's designed to do at its best and highest performance level. So for our athletes, and 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 I think this is where, you know, again, that Am I, am I building muscle? Am I getting stronger? What's working for me? What do I need to change now? Because I've gotten in this same pattern, right, Aaron, same pattern too long. Mm -hmm. So I have to change things up and, and not be afraid to do that. So sometimes it's, I've been so keto or so keto green for so long, and I'm going for this triathlon, I'm going to carb up in order to do this triathlon. Now, I mean, don't do a, tri do a sprint triathlon, don't do a long triathlon, destructive. But anyway, that's another story. Okay, so or I'm doing these weight lift, I'm doing whatever it is, this challenge. And so optimizing for that time. But if I speak after I've been carb bloated, I mean, I'm going to forget a lot of what I'm talking about, right? So I can't do it. I have to go into a presentation um, in ketosis. And I have to, when I'm, when I'm pray, when I have to make a big decision in my life, do I buy this house in Dallas and do I move from Georgia? I mean, I fast before I make these decisions. I want clarity. I want clarity and I want the, you know, I want to have the greatest connection to my creator and I want to have that, that yeah. sense of, okay, nothing else is clouding my decision. This is totally mm -hmm. what has to happen to the best of my ability, right or wrong, be strong about it. And I do that in a fasted state. Yeah. Yeah. And we talk about how important it is to learn how to eat before you learn how to fast. Oh, so that's great. Well-fed fasting can be dangerous. So you've got to learn how to eat first. And then to, I already heard you say it. We kind of work our way into that sort of a paradigm, which I love. Do you know how I articulated it to my client recently was this idea of sending safe signals to your body, yes. right? So yes, we, we fasted for 18 hours, 20 hours, but then we had this amazing nourishing meal. Your body was like, great body is wired for that, but the body is not wired for these dribs and drabs of meager, pathetic <laughs> dribbles of low calorie food that sends a scarcity signal. Like something's going on in the environment. This animal is eating rice cakes. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> hundred right. calorie snack bags. Yeah. Can we put a big red X on those? Because that is, I mean, that's restrictive. It is. I mean, that, and then what's it telling your mind? You're exactly it, right. It tells your body, like things are not good right now. Like you get to circle the wagons metabolically and just like, cause something weird's going on. It's, so like this whole idea of learning how to eat before you learn how to fast and learning how to eat is the skill to master. <laughs> I, I really love the sound of your book. Like, first of all, yes, very clever name menu pause, because there's these pauses that happen. I didn't pick up on that until you explained it. Like we pause this and now we're going to try this and we pause this for a bit. And now we move on to this. And there's a menu component. You were showing us some of the pictures before we press record. So so in addition to like educating people through this pair, this protocol, you also have uh, recipes in the book. Over 125 recipes, gorgeous photography, little breakouts on menopause around the world, the five different plans and a chapter on pausing what no longer serves you. Ooh, 
job. Wow. So when does it come out? When can we buy April, it? Buy April 12th, April 12th, available everywhere books are sold and, and definitely come back with your receipt number to my website for those extra book bonuses and batch cooking. So if you guys like batch cooking, do it all at a time. Yes. Like six days. So we've got those batch cooking guides too. Gosh, it sounds amazing. It's fun. It's good. And it's good recipes. And plus from, you know, like I grew up as a foodie, my mom was a baker and also Middle Eastern. So food like the Middle Eastern foods and, and I just, I, I love them. How do I make So I give my, you know, twist on a healthy tabbouleh and I'm not using cauliflower rice in place of the cracked wheat. And, you know, again, parsley is a, a medicinal food and it's a natural diuretic and it's so healing for the body. It's really, everything is easy to make. I'm a single mom with kids, right. And a business to run and, you know, employees all over the world now. So like I have to make things as simple for me as possible too. And, um, and so then my kefta recipe and my, you know, Texas rodeo skillet recipe. Oh my gosh, you guys like and it's fun names and little stories with each of which have some with each of the recipes too. So Amazing. And they're designed to support, you know, is to support your healing, to support this journey, to support this transition and to feel satisfied, not deprived. Yeah. 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 Awesome. All right. So where do people go? What's it oh. the website again? And, and oh. any social media stuff? Yeah. So dranna.com, D-R-A-N-N-A.com is my website. So you can find me and my books there too. And anywhere books are sold for menu pause and at the girlfriend doctor on social media at the girlfriend doctor. Oh, I love it. This was so great. I learned so much as I did last time too. So thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and your passion for this. My pleasure. Time just flew by. I'm like, can we just keep talking? (laughs) I love it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Got it. This podcast was brought to you by Primal Health Coach Institute. To learn more about how to become a successful health coach, get in touch with us by visiting primalhealthcoach.com forward slash call. Or if you're already a successful health coach, practitioner, influencer, or thought leader with a thriving business and an interesting story, we'd love to hear from you. Connect with us at hello at primalhealthcoach.com and let us know why we need to interview you for Health Coach Radio. Thanks for listening.